I became what I am today at the age of 12. I remember the precise moment, crouching behind a crumbling wall, peeking into a deserted alley. Looking back, I realize I've been peeking into that alley for the last 26 years. One day last summer, my friend, Rahim Khan, called from Pakistan. Standing in the kitchen, I knew it wasn't just Rahim Khan on the line. It was my past of unatoned sins. After I hung up, I went for a walk in Golden Gate Park. I glanced up and saw a pair of kites, red with long blue tails, soaring in the sky. And suddenly, Hassan's voice whispered in my ear, For you, a thousand times over. Hassan, the hair-lipped kite runner. I sat on a bench and thought about something Rahim Khan said before he hung up. There is a way to be good again. I thought of the life I'd lived in Kabul until the winter of 1975 came along and changed everything. When we were children, Hassan and I used to climb the poplar trees in the drive of my father's house. We'd sit across from each other laughing, pelting each other with dried mulberries. I can still see Hassan, sunlight flickering on his perfectly round face. A face like a Chinese doll chiseled from hardwood. His slanting eyes like bamboo leaves. The cleft lip just left of midline. Sometimes I talked him into firing walnuts with his slingshot at the neighbor's dog. Hassan never wanted to, but if asked, really asked, he wouldn't deny me. Hassan never denied me anything. And he was deadly with his slingshot. If his father caught us, he'd get mad, or as mad as someone as gentle as Ali could get. Hassan never told on me, never said that shooting the walnuts was my idea. The poplar trees lined the drive into my father's estate. Everyone agreed that Baba had built the most beautiful house in northern Kabul. Intricate mosaics covered the floor and gold-stitched tapestries lined the walls. Upstairs was Baba's study, where he and his friends reclined on black leather chairs after Ali had served dinner. Sometimes I'd ask if I could sit with them, but Baba would say, This is grown-up time. Why don't you go and read one of those books of yours? The living room downstairs had a cabinet full of pictures. An old grainy photo of my grandfather and King Nader Shah taken two years before his assassination. A picture of my parents' wedding night. And one of Baba and his business partner Rahim Khan. I'm the baby in Baba's arms, but it's Rahim Khan's little finger my hand is curled around. From the dining room, a large sliding glass door opened onto a semicircular terrace that overlooked the grounds. Baba and Ali had planted a vegetable garden along the eastern wall. Tomatoes, mint, peppers, and a row of corn that never really took. At the southern end of the garden was a modest little mud hut where Hassan lived with his father. Hassan was born in the winter of 1964, just a year after my mother died giving birth to me. In the 18 years I lived in that house, I stepped into Hassan and Ali's quarters only a handful of times. When we were done playing for the day, I went to Baba's mansion, Hassan, to the mud shack where he'd been born. While my mother died during childbirth, Hassan's ran off with a troupe of traveling dancers. I'm told no one was really surprised. People had raised their eyebrows when Ali married a beautiful woman 19 years younger than him. Polya had left Ali with a twisted leg. In the neighborhood, the older kids chased him and called him names like Babalu or Bogeyman. They shouted, Hey, Babalu! You flat-nosed Hazara! They called him flat-nosed because of his mongoloid features. School textbooks barely mention the Hazaras, but I found a chapter on their history in one of my mother's old books. I read that my people, the Pashtuns, had driven them from their lands, burned their homes and sold their women. 
The book said part of the reason was that the Pashtuns were Sunni Muslims, while Hazaras were Shia. The book told me a lot of things my teachers hadn't mentioned. Ali never retaliated against his tormentors. He was immune. He'd found his joy in his smiling son. After Hassan's mother left, Baba hired the same wet nurse who'd fed me. Hassan and I fed from the same breast, took our first steps on the same lawn and under the same roof. We spoke our first words. Mine was Baba. His was Amir. My name. Looking back, I think the foundation for what happened was already laid in those first words. La has it. My father once wrestled a black bear in Baluchistan with his bare hands. If the story had been about anyone else, it would have been dismissed as laugh, the Afghan tendency to exaggerate. But my father was a towering man with a thick beard and a wayward crop of curly brown hair. When I was five, he decided to build an orphanage. Rahim Khan told me Baba drew the blueprints himself and personally funded the entire project. On the day the orphanage was opened, I was so proud he was my father. When people had told Baba that running a business wasn't in his blood, he proved them all wrong by becoming one of the richest merchants in Kabul. With me as the glaring exception, my father molded the world to his liking. I always felt that Baba hated me a little. And why not? I killed his beloved wife, hadn't I? The least I could have done was to have the decency to turn out a little more like him. But I hadn't. Not at all. One night, passing Baba's study, I overheard him talking to Rahim Khan. He's always buried in those books, or shuffling around the house like he's lost in some dream. And? came Rahim Khan's voice. I wasn't like that. Rahim Khan laughed. Children aren't coloring books. You don't get to fill them in with your favorite colors. It has nothing to do with that. Then what? Sometimes I look out of this window and I see him playing on the street. I see how the other boys push him around and you know, he never fights back. He just drops his head. So he's not violent, Rahim Khan said. It's more than that. There is something missing in that boy. Yes, a mean streak. Self-defense has nothing to do with meanness. You know what happened when the other boys tease him? Hassan steps in and fends them off. And when they come home, I say to him, How did Hassan get that scrape on his face? And he says, he fell down. You know, if I hadn't seen the doctor pull him out of my wife with my own eyes, I'd never believe he is my son. The next morning, while he was preparing my breakfast, Hassan asked me if something was wrong. I snapped at him to mind his own business. Rahim Khan had been wrong about the mean streak. The curious thing was, I never thought of Hassan and me as friends. Never mind that to me, the face of Afghanistan is that of a boy with a Chinese doll face perpetually lit by a hair-lipped smile. Because history isn't easy to overcome, neither is religion. In the end, I was a Pashtun, and he was a Hazara. I was Sunni, and he was Shia, and nothing was ever going to change that. During the school year, we had a daily routine. By the time I dragged myself out of bed, Hassan had already prayed the morning namaz with Ali and prepared my breakfast. While I ate and complained about homework, Hassan made my bed, ironed my outfit for the day, packed my books and pencils. Then Baba and I drove off in his black Ford Mustang, and Hassan stayed at home and helped Ali with the day's chores. After school, Hassan and I usually met up grabbed a book and trotted up the hill just north of the house. There was an abandoned cemetery at the top 
with a pomegranate tree near the entrance. I carved our names on it. Amir and Hassan, the sultans of Kabul. We climbed into his branches, then I would read to Hassan. That Hassan would grow up illiterate like Ali had been decided the day he had been born. When I was in fifth grade, we had a mullah who taught us about Islam. He explained the virtues of zakat and the duty of hajj and told us the intricacies of performing the five daily namaz prayers. He told us one day that Islam considered drinking a terrible sin. In those days, drinking was fairly common in Kabul. No one gave you a public lashing for it. That evening when Baba was pouring himself a whiskey in his study, I told him what the mullah had said and asked him if the whiskey made him a sinner. He pulled me onto his knee. I'll tell you what your father thinks about sin, Amir. But first understand this. You'll never learn anything of value from those bearded idiots. Piss on the beards of all those self-righteous monkeys. They do nothing but thumb their prayer beads and recite a book written in a tongue they don't even understand. God help us if Afghanistan falls into their hands. But the mullah seems nice, I tittered. So did Gangir's Khan. But you ask about sin. No matter what the mullah teaches, there's only one sin, and that's theft. Every other sin is a variation of theft. Do you understand? No, Baba, I said, desperately wishing I did. Baba sighed. When you kill a man, you steal a life. You steal his wife's right to a husband, rob his children of a father. When you tell a lie, you steal someone's right to the truth. When you cheat, you steal the right to fairness. Do you see? There's no act more wretched than stealing a mayor. If there's a God out there, then I hope he has more important things to attend to than my drinking scotch or eating pork. He eased me off his knee. As I watched him fill his glass, I wondered how much time would pass before we talked again the way we just had. That night, playing cards in the kitchen, Hassan and I heard a roar like thunder and the rat-a-tat of gunfire. The shooting and the explosions lasted less than an hour, but they frightened us badly. They were foreign sounds to us then. The generation of Afghan children, whose ears would know nothing but the sounds of bombs and guns, wasn't yet born. Huddled in the dining room waiting for the sun to rise, none of us had any notion that a way of life had ended. As it turned out, they hadn't shot much of anything that night in 1973. But Kabul awoke the next morning to find that the monarchy was a thing of the past. The morning after the coup, Hassan and I were on our way up our hill when a rock struck Hassan in the back. We whirled round and my heart dropped. Asif and two of his friends were approaching us. If you were a kid living in the Wazir Akbar Khan district of Kabul, you knew about Asif and his famous brass knuckles. And of all the neighborhood boys who taunted Hassan's father, Asif was the most relentless. Hey you, flat-nosed babalu, you slant-eyed donkey. Now he was walking towards us, hands on his hips, a ghastly grin on his lips. Not for the first time, it occurred to me that Asif might not be entirely sane. Have you heard the news, boys? The king is gone. Long live the president. My father knows Dawood Khan. Did you know that, Amir? And I have a vision I'm going to share with our new president. Do you know what it is? I shook my head as his eyes flickered towards Hassan. Afghanistan is the land of the Pashtun. We are the true Afghan, not this flat nose here. His people pollute our homeland. He reached into the back pocket of his jeans. 
I'll ask the president to do what the king didn't have the quat to do. To rid Afghanistan of all the dirty Hazaras. I saw with a sinking heart what he had fished out of his pocket. The metal knuckle sparkled in the sun. Just let us go, Asif, I said, hating the way my voice trembled. We're not bothering you. Ah, oh, you're bothering me, Amir. In fact, you bother me more than this Hazara. If idiots like you and your father didn't take these people in, we'd be rid of them by now. You're a disgrace to Afghanistan. As I looked into Asif's crazy eyes, he raised his fist. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw a flurry of movement. Hassan bent down and stood up quickly. Asif's eyes widened with surprise. I turned to see Hassan pointing his slingshot directly at Asif's face. In the cup was a stone the size of a walnut. Asif gritted his teeth. Put it down, you motherless Hazara. Hassan's hand trembled. Please leave us alone, Aha. Asif smiled. Maybe you didn't notice. There are three of us, and two of you. Hassan shifted nervously. But I am the one holding the slingshot. If you make a move, they'll have to change your nickname from Asif the Air Eater to One-Eyed Asif. Asif searched Hassan's face intently. Whatever he found must have convinced him because he lowered his fist. You should know something about me, Hazara. I'm a very patient person. Someday I'll make you face me one on one. When he'd gone, I watched Hassan trying to tuck the slingshot in his waist. His mouth was curled into something that was supposed to be a reassuring smile. But it took his trembling hands five tries to tie the string of his trousers. Early the following winter, Hassan and I were playing in the yard when Ali called us in from the snow. It was Hassan's birthday. Baba never missed it. As we walked into his study, I looked for the gift wrap box, but there was just Baba and Ali and an Indian fellow who looked like a maths teacher. Baba smiled at Hassan. This is Dr. Kumar. He's a plastic surgeon from New Delhi. Hassan looked from Dr. Kumar to Baba to Ali. His hand touched his upper lip. It's an unusual present, I know, Baba said. I'm probably not what you had in mind, but this present will last you forever. I wished I too had some kind of scar that would beget Baba's sympathy. It wasn't fair. Hassan hadn't done anything to earn Baba's affections. The surgery went well. We were all a little shocked when they first removed the bandages. But we kept our smiles on, just as Dr. Kumar had instructed. Baba handed Hassan a mirror and he took a long, thoughtful look into it. Then he whispered, Tashakur, thank you. When his lips twisted, in spite of the swelling, I knew just what he was doing. He was smiling. Soon the wound healed and there was just a pink jagged line running up from his lip. By the following winter, it was only a faint scar, which was ironic, because that was the winter that Hassan stopped smiling. Winter was every kid's favorite season in Kabul. The schools were closed and Hassan and I spent months playing cards by the stove, building snowmen and, of course, flying kites and running them. I loved winter even more because as the trees froze, the chill between Baba and me thawed a little. And the reason for that was the kites. Every district in Kabul held a kite fighting tournament. And if you were a boy living in Kabul, the day of the tournament was the highlight of the season. Hassan and I spent hours making our own string, or ta. We'd feed up to 500 feet of it through a mixture of ground glass and glue and then wind it round a wooden spool. By the time the snow melted, every boy in Kabul bore telltale horizontal gashes on his fingers from a winter of fighting kites. The kite fighting tournament started early in the morning and didn't end until only the winning kite flew in the sky. 
The streets were filled with kite fighters, jerking and tugging on their lines, squinting up to the sky trying to gain position to cut the opponent's line. Every kite fighter had an assistant. In my case, Hassan. The rules were simple. Fly your kite, cut the opponents, good luck. The real fun began when a kite was cut. That was where the kite runners came in. The kids who chased the wind-blown kite until it came spiraling down in a field or dropping on someone's rooftop. For the kite runners, the most coveted prize was the last remaining kite of a winter tournament. It was a trophy of honor. Something to be displayed on a mantelpiece for guests to admire. Over the years, I'd seen a lot of guys run kites, but Hassan was by far the greatest. It was downright eerie the way he always got to the spot the kite would land before the kite did, as if he had some sort of inner compass. Once, when a crowd of runners sat off in one direction, he ran round a corner the opposite way from the way that the kite was drifting. We're losing it, I cried. Trust me, he called, his head down as he bolted along, not even looking at the sky. We ended up on a rutted dirt road. Hassan sat cross-legged at the foot of a tree eating a fistful of dried mulberries. What are we doing? I panted. Sit with me, Amir Raha. It's coming. How could you know? Would I ever lie to you, Amir? I don't know. Would you? Hassan looked in my eyes. I rather eat dirt. To this day, I find it hard to gaze directly at people like Hassan. People who mean everything they say. Then I looked up and saw the kite plummeting towards us. Heard shouts. Saw a melee of kite runners. But they were wasting their time. Hassan stood with his arms wide open, waiting. And may God strike me blind if the kite didn't just drop into his outstretched arms. In the winter of 1975, word had it, the tournament was going to be the biggest for 25 years. A few nights before, Baba and I were sipping tea in his study when he said casually, I think maybe you'll win this year. What do you think? I didn't know what to think. I was a good kite fighter. A few times, I'd even come close to winning. But coming close was nothing. Baba hadn't come close. He'd won. He was used to winning at everything he set his mind to. However, his comment planted a seed in my head. I would win the tournament, and I was going to run that last kite and bring it home to Baba. Show him once and for all that his son was worthy. The morning of the competition, the streets glistened with fresh snow and the sky was a blameless blue. When Hassan and I stepped through the wrought iron gates, I turned to our rooftop and saw Baba and Rahim Khan sitting on a bench sipping tea. Suddenly, I wanted to go home. Why was I putting myself through this? I'm not sure I want to fly a kite today. Hassan looked at me. But it is a beautiful day. He licked his finger, held it to test the wind, and smiled. Let's fly! He lifted our kite and ran. The spool rolled in my hands. Hassan stopped about fifty feet away and held the kite high over his head. I jerked the string twice, our sign, and Hassan tossed the kite. Within a minute, it was rocketing to the sky. At least two dozen kites were already swooping like paper sharks roaming for prey. Within an hour, the number doubled. Soon, the cutting started, and the first of the defeated kites whirled out of control. They fell from the sky like shooting stars, with brilliant rippling tails. I kept stealing glances at Baba on the roof. They were coming down all over the place now, and I was still flying. A red kite was closing in on me. I tangled with it, and triumphed when he became impatient and tried to cut me from below. Within another hour, the number of surviving kites dwindled to a dozen. My legs ached, my neck was stiff, but with each defeated kite, hope grew in my heart, but my eyes kept returning to a blue kite that had been wreaking havoc. How many he cut? I asked Hassan. 
I count eleven. I didn't dare look at the roof. I had to concentrate. The tension was as taut as the glass string. People were stomping their feet, calling, "Cut him! Cut him!" All I heard was the blood thudding in my head. All I saw was the blue kite. And suddenly, I knew I was going to win. A gust of wind lifted my kite, and I took advantage, looped my kite on top of the blue one, and held position. The blue kite tried to maneuver out of trouble, but I didn't let go. You're almost there, Hassan panted. Then the moment came. I closed my eyes and loosened my grip on the string. It sliced my finger as the wind dragged, and then. I didn't need to hear the crowd roar to know. Hassan was screaming, and his arms were wrapped around my neck. Bravo! Bravo! I opened my eyes, saw the blue kite spinning wildly. Hassan looked up at me, and we smiled at each other. Then I was screaming, and everything was alive and good. I threw my free arm around Hassan, and we hopped up and down, both of us laughing. Both of us weeping. You won, Amira. We won. Was all I could say. I saw Baba on our roof pumping both of his fists. And that, right there, was the single greatest moment of my twelve years of life. Seeing Baba proud of me at last. But then he was motioning with his hands. Hassan looked at me. We celebrate later. Right now. I'm going to run that blue kite for you. He had already reached the street corner when he stopped and turned, cupping his hands round his mouth. For you, a thousand times over. I picked my way through the dwindling crowd in the bazaar, but there was no sign of Hassan. I described him to an old merchant. He eyed me up and down. What's a boy like you doing looking for Hazara? I control my impatience. He's our servant's son. The man rested an arm on his mule's back and pointed south. I think I saw him running that way. He had a blue kite in his hand. For you, a thousand times over, he promised. Good old Hassan, he'd run the last kite for me. Of course, they probably caught him by now. Who? The other boys who were chasing him. For the next few minutes, I poked my head behind every stall. I'd reached a secluded, muddy road when I heard voices up ahead coming from one of the alleys. I crept closer and peeked round the corner. Hassan was standing defiantly at the end, fist curled, legs slightly apart. Behind him, on a pile of rubble, was the blue kite, my key to Baba's heart. Blocking Hassan's way were three boys, the same three that had threatened us the day Hassan had saved us with his slingshot. Asif was twirling his familiar brass knuckles. The other two shifted nervously on their feet. Where's your slingshot, Hazara? Asif sneered. I exhaled slowly. Quietly, I felt paralyzed. I watched them close in on the boy I'd grown up with, the boy whose hair-lit face had been my first memory. But today is your lucky day, Hazara, Asif said. I'm in a mood to forgive. What do you say to that boy? That's generous, one of them blurted. He was trying to sound like Asif, except there was a tremor in his voice. Then I understood. He wasn't afraid of Hassan. He was afraid because he had no idea what Asif had in mind. Asif waved his hand. Of course, nothing is free in this world, and my pardon comes with a small price. It's going to cost you that blue kite. Even from where I was standing, I could see the fear in Hassan's eyes, but he shook his head. Amir won the tournament fair and square, and I ran this kite for him. This is his kite. <laughs> a loyal Hazara, loyal as a dog, Asif sneered.
But before you sacrifice yourself for him, think. Would he do the same for you? Have you ever wondered why he never includes you in games when he has guests? I tell you why, Hazara. Because to him, you're nothing but an ugly pet. Something to play with when he is bored or kick when he is angry. Don't ever fool yourself, you're something more. Amir Aha and I are friends, Hassan said. Asif laughed. <laughs> you pathetic fool. Now, just give us that kite. Hassan stooped and picked up a rock. Whatever you wish. Hasif unbuttoned his coat. I opened my mouth, almost said something. Almost. The rest of my life might have turned out differently, if I had. But I didn't. I just watched. Asif motioned to the other two. I've changed my mind. I'd let you keep the kite. So, it will always remind you of what I'm about to do. Then he charged. Knocking Hassan to the ground, the other two followed. I closed my eyes. But when I opened them again, there were two things I couldn't stop looking at. One was the blue kite. The other was Hassan's pants, thrown on a heap of eroded bricks. All I want you weaklings to do is to hold him down. Asif unzipped his jeans. Hassan didn't struggle, didn't even whimper. He moved his head slightly, and I caught a glimpse of his face, saw the resignation in it. It was the look of the lamb. I stopped watching, turned away from the alley. I realized I was weeping. I had one final opportunity to decide who I was going to be. I could step into that alley, stand up for Hassan the way he'd stood up for me. Or I could run. In the end, I ran. Back in the bazaar, I hid behind a stall. Fifteen minutes later, I heard voices and watched Asif and the other two sprinting by, laughing. I forced myself to wait ten more minutes. Then I walked back towards the alley. Hassan was walking slowly towards me. He had the blue kite in his hands. That was the first thing I saw. His shirt was ripped. He was swaying on his feet as if he was going to collapse. Then he steadied himself, handed me the kite. Where were you? I said. I I've been looking for you. He dragged his sleeve across his face. I waited for him to say something. But we just stood there in silence. I was grateful for the early evening shadows that fell on his face and concealed mine. I was glad I didn't have to return his gaze. Did he know I knew? And if he knew, then what would I see if I did look in his eyes? Blame? Indignation? Or what I feared most? Guileless devotion? It happened just the way I'd imagined. I opened the door to the study. Baba and Rahim Khan turned their heads and a smile played on my father's lips. I put the kite down, walked into his open arms, buried my face in the warmth of his chest and wept. Baba held me close, rocking me back and forth. In his arms I forgot what I had done. And that was good. For a week... I barely saw Hassan. I woke to find breakfast already on the kitchen table, my clothes ironed. Hassan used to wait for me before he started ironing so we could talk. Now only the folded clothes greeted me, and a breakfast I hardly ate. Lately, all he seemed to want to do is sleep, said Ali. After the kite tournament, he come home a little bloody. Did something happen to him, Amir? I shrugged. How should I know? Maybe he's sick. Baba and I were finally friends. 
We've gone to the zoo and then the kebab house and Baba had told me stories of his travels to India and Russia. That should have been fun. I finally had what I wanted all those years. Except now that I had it, I felt empty. That night in my room, a wedge of moonlight streamed in through the window. I watched Hassan get raped, I said aloud. A part of me was hoping someone would hear, so I wouldn't have to live with this lie anymore. But in the silence that followed, I understood the nature of my new curse. I was going to get away with it. My memory of the rest of the winter is pretty hazy. I was fairly happy when Baba was home. But when he was out, I closed myself in my room and I read. To my dismay, Hassan kept trying to rekindle things between us. One day he knocked on my door. What is it? I'm going to the baker, he said from the other side. I wonder if you want to come along. I think I'll just read, I said rubbing my temples. Lately, every time Hassan was around, I was getting a headache. It's a sunny day. I can see that. Might be fun to go for a walk. You go. Something thumped against the door, maybe his forehead. I don't know what I have done, Amir Haha. I wish you'd tell me. You haven't done anything, Hassan. Just go. You can tell me. I stopped doing it. I snapped. I want you to stop harassing me. I want you to go away. I wished he'd break the door open and tell me off. It would have made things easier, but he didn't. When I opened the door a minute later, he wasn't there. I fell on my bed, buried my head under the pillow and cried. Hassan milled about the periphery of my life after that. But even when he wasn't around, he was. He was there in the warm slippers left outside my door, in the wood already burning in the stove when I came down for breakfast. Everywhere I turned, I saw signs of his loyalty, his goddamn unwavering loyalty. Early in the spring... A few days before the new school year started, Baba and I were planting tulips in the garden when I came right out and said it. Baba, have you ever thought about getting new servants? He buried his trowel in the dirt. What did you say? I was just wondering, that's all. Why would I ever want to do that? It was just a question. I was already sorry I'd spoken. Is this about you and Hassan? I know there is something going on between you, but whatever it is, you have to deal with it. He picked up his trowel. I grew up with Ali. My father took him in. He loved Ali like his own son. Forty years Ali's been with my family and you think I'm just going to throw him out? He shook his head. You bring me shame, Amir. Hassan's not going anywhere, do you understand? I picked up a fistful of soil and let it pour between my fingers. I said, do you understand? Hassan stays right here with us, where he belongs. This is his home and we are his family. Don't you ever ask me that question again. One sluggish, hazy afternoon early that summer, I asked Hassan to go up the hill with me. Told him I wanted to read him a new story I'd written. He was hanging clothes to dry and I saw his eagerness in the hurried way he finished the job. We climbed the hill, making small talk, and at the top we sat under the shade of our pomegranate tree. I put the story on the ground, then picked up an overripe pomegranate and stood up. What would you do if I hit you with this? Hassan's smile wilted. Next to him, the pages of the story I'd promised to read fluttered in the breeze. I hurled a pomegranate at him. It struck him in the chest, exploding in a spray of red pulp. Hassan's cry was pregnant with surprise and pain. Hit me back! I snapped. Hassan looked from the stain on his chest to me. Get up! Hit me! Hassan did get up, but he just stood there, looking dazed. I hit him with another pomegranate, on the shoulder this time. Hit me back! I wanted him to give me the punishment I craved, 
so maybe I'd finally sleep at night. Maybe then things could return to how they used to be between us. But Hassan did nothing as I pelted him again and again. I don't know how many times I hit him. All I know is that when I finally stopped, exhausted and panting, Hassan did pick up a pomegranate. He walked towards me, opened it, and crushed it on his own forehead. There, he croaked. Are you satisfied? Then he turned and started down the hill. Baba threw an enormous party for my 13th birthday. Sitting in my room the next morning, I ripped open box after box of presents and several envelopes containing cash. I didn't want any of it. It was all blood money. Baba would have never thrown me a party if I hadn't won the kite tournament. Baba gave me two presents, a bicycle and a wristwatch. I didn't even try the watch on. When I went downstairs, Ali appeared. The opportunity never presented itself last night for Hassan and me to give you this. We hope you like it. Happy birthday. Thank you, Ali. I opened the parcel and found a brand new hardback copy of the Shah Nama, the book Hassan most loved me to read him. Hassan said your copy was old and ragged, that pictures are hand-drawn in this one. It's beautiful, I said, and it was, and I suspected not inexpensive either. I wanted to tell Ali it wasn't the book, but I who was unworthy. Thank Hassan for me, I said. I ended up tossing the book on the pile of gifts, but my eyes kept going back to it. Before I went to bed that night, I asked Baba if he'd seen my new watch anywhere. The next morning, I waited in my room until Ali and Hassan had gone to the bazaar. Then I took a couple of envelopes of cash and my watch, and I tiptoed out. I crossed the yard and entered Ali and Hassan's hut. I lifted Hassan's mattress and planted my new watch and a handful of banknotes under it. Then I knocked on Baba's door and told him what I hoped would be the last in a long line of shameful lies. They'd both been crying. I could tell from their eyes. They stood before Baba, hand in hand, and I wondered how and when I'd become capable of causing this kind of pain. Baba came right out and asked, Did you steal that money? Did you steal Amir's watch, Hassan? Hassan's reply was a single word. Yes. I flinched as if I'd been slapped. I almost blurted out the truth. Then I understood. This was Hassan's final sacrifice for me. If he had said no, Baba would have believed him because we all knew Hassan never lied. And if Baba believed him, then I would be revealed for what I really was. Baba would never forgive me. And that led to another understanding. Hassan knew I'd seen everything in that alley. That I'd stood there and done nothing. He knew I'd betrayed him, and yet he was rescuing me once again. I loved him in that moment. Loved him more than I'd ever loved anyone. And I wanted to tell them all that I was a snake in the grass. I wasn't worthy of this sacrifice. And I would have told, except that a part of me was glad. Glad that this would all be over soon. Baba would dismiss them and life would move on. I wanted to start with a clean slate. I wanted to be able to breathe again. Except that Baba stunned me by saying, I forgive you. Hadn't he set me on his lap and said that theft was the one unforgivable sin? How could he just forgive Hassan? And if Baba could forgive Hassan, then why couldn't he forgive me for not being the son he always wanted? We're leaving, Aha Saib, Ali said. We can't live here anymore. As the color drained from Baba's face, Ali curled his arm round his son's shoulder. 
It was a protective gesture, and when he glanced my way, his cold look showed me who he was protecting Hassan from. I realized Hassan had told him everything, about Asif and his friends, about the kite, about me. Strangely, I was glad that someone knew me for who I really was. I was tired of pretending. I don't care about the money or the watch, Baba said. I don't understand why you're doing this. Haven't I always provided well for you? I'm sorry, Aha Sab, but our bags are already packed. Then I saw Baba do something I'd never seen him do before. He cried. Please. I'll never forget the pain in Baba's plea. Slithering beads of rain sluiced down my bedroom window as I watched Ali haul the lone suitcase carrying all of their belongings to Baba's car. I saw Baba slam the boot shut and walk to the driver's side. He leaned in and said something to Ali in the back. When he straightened, I saw in his slumping shoulders that the life I'd known was over. Baba slid in. The headlights came on and cut twin funnels of light in the rain. I watched Baba's car pull away, taking with it the person whose first spoken word had been my name. I stepped back, and all I saw was rain through window panes that looked like melting silver. There were about a dozen of us, sitting in the back of a tarpaulin-covered Russian truck, our suitcases between our legs. The driver was a people smuggler. It was a pretty lucrative business driving people out of Shurawi occupied Kabul. He was taking us to Jalalabad, where his brother was waiting with another group of refugees to drive us across the Khyber Pass to Pakistan. I thought of the way we'd left the house, as if we were just going out for a walk. Dishes smeared with kofte, piled in the kitchen sink, Baba's suit still hanging in the wardrobes. A few items of clothing were missing from the cupboards, as was the leather-bound notebook Rahim Khan had given me to write my stories in. We hadn't told Jaludin, our seventh servant in five years. You couldn't trust anyone in Kabul anymore. We rolled into Jalalabad about an hour before sunrise. Then the driver informed us that for the next leg of the journey, we'd be hidden inside a fuel tank. Panic! You open your mouth so wide, your jaws creak. You order your lungs to draw air, now! The air was so thick, it was almost solid. I wanted to break it into pieces and cram it down my throat. And the stench of the gasoline! My eyes stung from the fumes. You could die in a place like this, I thought. And then a small miracle. Baba tucked at my sleeve and something glowed green in the pitch black. Baba's wristwatch. I kept my eyes glued to the fluorescent green hands as the truck bounced from side to side and heads banged against metal. Think of something good, Baba said in my ear. I let my mind wander. Hassan and I stand ankle deep in grass. Our eyes turned up to the kite in the sky. I'm tugging on the line. Hassan lets the spool roll. The kite spins, dips, steadies. Our twin shadows dance on the rippling grass. The rest of the journey is a haze, until the blinding light of the early morning as I climbed out of the fuel tank. We're in Pakistan, Amir, Baba said. My eyes turned to our suitcases. They made me sad. After everything Baba had dreamed, planned, fought for, this was the summation of his life. One disappointing son and two suitcases. Baba loved the idea of America. It was living in America that gave him an ulcer. I remember the two of us walking through the park a few streets from our apartment. Baba enlightened me with his politics. He loathed Jimmy Carter, whom he called Big Tooth Cretin. 
In 1980, when the U.S. announced it would boycott the Olympic Games in Moscow, he exclaimed, "Brezhnev is massacring Afghans," and all that peanut eater can say is, "I won't come swim in your pool." What America needed, he said, was a man to be reckoned with, and that someone came in the form of Ronald Reagan. Most of our neighbors in Fremont were bus drivers, gas station attendants, and unwed mothers collecting welfare. Baba was the lone Republican. The Bay Area smog stung his eyes, and the traffic noise gave him headaches. The fruit was never sweet enough. The water never clean enough. He missed the sugarcane fields. Missed people milling in and out of his house. Missed walking down the bustling aisles of the bazaar and greeting people who knew him and his father, knew his grandfather. For me, America was a place to bury my memories. For Baba, a place to mourn his. Maybe we should go back to Peshawar, I said. We'd spent six months there waiting for our visas. You were happier there, Baba. Peshawar was good for me, not good for you. I reached across the table and put my hand on his, my student hand, clean. And soft, on his laborer's hand, grubby, and calloused. I thought of the train sets and bikes he'd bought me in Kabul. Now America, one last gift for Amir. Just one month after we arrived, Baba found a job as an assistant at a gas station. He was determined not to live on welfare. Six days a week, he pulled twelve-hour shifts, pumping gas, changing oil, and washing windshields. In the summer of 1983, I graduated from high school. At 20, I was by far the oldest senior, tossing his motorboat on the football field. I remember losing Baba in the crowd. He was wearing his only suit, the same brown suit he wore to Afghan weddings and funerals. And the red tie I'd bought for his fiftieth birthday that year. When I found him, he motioned for me to wear my motorboat and took a picture. I smiled for him. In a way, this was his day more than mine. He curled his arm round my neck and gave my forehead a single kiss. I am Muftakir Amir, he said, proud. I liked being on the receiving end of that look. We went to a kebab house and then a bar across the street. He treated everyone to drinks. Baba always knew how to start a party. When we left, everyone was sad to see him go. Kabul, Peshawar, California, same old Baba. I thought, smiling. I drove home in his old Buick. Keep driving. To the end of the block, he commanded. He had me park at the south end of the street and handed me a set of keys. There, he pointed to the car in front of us. It needs painting, and I'll have one of those guys at the garage put in new shocks. But it runs. I took the keys, stunned. You'll need it to go to college, he said. My eyes filled with tears. Thank you, Baba. He smiled and leaned back against the headrest. I wish Hassan had been with us today. A pair of steel hands closed around my windpipe. I rolled down the window, waited for the steel hands to loosen their grip. The summer I turned 21, Baba sold his car and bought a dilapidated Volkswagen bus. On Saturday, he'd wake me at dawn. We'd scan the classifieds in the local paper and circle the garage sales. We bought knickknacks that people no longer wanted. Then early Sunday morning, we drove to San Jose flea market and sold the junk for a small profit. By that summer, Afghan families were working an entire section of the market. There was an unspoken code of behavior. You greeted the guy across the aisle. You invited him for a bite of potato bolani, and you chatted. 
Tea, politics, and scandal. The ingredients of an Afghan Sunday at the flea market. Baba sauntered down the aisle greeting people he knew from Kabul. One Sunday morning, he came back to our store with a distinguished-looking man he introduced as General Tahiri. Why did that name sound familiar? The general put his hand on Baba's shoulder. Your father and I hunted pheasants together one summer in Jalalabad. If I recall correctly, your father's eye proved as keen in the hunt as it had in business. Baba kicked a wooden tennis racket on our tarpaulin spread. Some business. The general patted his shoulder. Life goes on. Padar Jan, you forgot your tea. A young woman's voice. She was standing behind us. A slim, hip beauty with velvety coal black hair, an open thermos in her hand. The general took the tea. You're so kind, my dear. Before she turned to go, I saw a brown, sickle-shaped birthmark on the smooth skin, just above her left jawline. She walked to a dull grey van two aisles away. My daughter Soraya. General Tahiri took a deep breath, like a man eager to change the subject, and checked his gold pocket watch. Well, time to go and set up. For the rest of that day, I fought the urge to look towards the grey van. It came to me on our way home, Tahiri. Wasn't there some story floating around about Tahiri's daughter? I asked casually. You know me, Baba said. Talk turns to gossip, and I walk away. He looked at me coyly. Why do you ask? I shrugged. All I've heard is there was a man once, and things、uh, didn't go well. He said this gravely. As if he disclosed she had breast cancer. Oh, I hear she's a decent girl, hardworking and kind. But no suitors have knocked on the general's door since. It may be unfair, but it's what happens. Laying awake in bed that night, I thought of Saraya Tahiri's sickle-shaped birthmark and the way her luminous eyes had fleetingly held mine. On Sunday, I invent an excuse to stroll past the Tahiri stand, which Baba acknowledged with a playful smirk. Sometimes Soraya sat alone, the general off to some other row to socialize. I promised myself I'd talk to her before the summer was over. Then one sweltering Sunday, I spotted the Tahiri van next to a kiosk selling mangoes on a stick. She was alone, greeting. Salam. I didn't mean to disturb you. Is General Saib here today? She pointed to her right. Her bracelet slipped down to her elbow, silver against olive. Will you tell him I stopped by to pay my respects? My name is Amir. I began to leave, stopped, and turned. I said it before I had a chance to lose my nerve. Can I ask you what you're reading? I felt the collective eyes of the flea market shift to us. This was teetering dangerously on the verge of gossip material. By Afghan standards, my question had been bold: Would she take my dare? She turned the book so the cover faced me. Wuthering Heights. Have you read it? I nodded. Sad stories make good books, she said. As we started chatting, her eyes flicked from side to side, checking for the general. I suppose. I was about to take my leave when her mother came up the aisle with a bag of fruit. When she saw us, her eyes bounced from Soraya to me and back. She smiled. Amir Jan, my husband has told me all about you. It's good to see you. How is your father? He's well, thank you. You know your grandfather, the judge. Now his uncle and my grandfather were cousins, so you see we're related. She smiled again. If I was going to have an adversary, it wouldn't be her. For a few weeks after that, I'd wait until the general went for a stroll, then walked past the Tahiri stand. 
If Soraya's mother was there, she'd offer me tea. I liked it when she was there. Soraya was more relaxed, more talkative, as if her mother's presence legitimized whatever was happening between us. That summer, Baba caught a cold. It started with a hacking cough and sniffles. He got over the sniffles, but the cough persisted. Two weeks later, I caught him coughing blood-stained phlegm into the toilet. I took him to the doctor, who referred him to the pulmonary clinic. He's got a spot on his lung, the young doctor said. Cancer, Baba asked casually. Possible. It's suspicious, anyway. The specialist was a softly spoken Iranian. He told us he'd have to perform a bronchoscopy to get a piece of the lung mass for pathology. As I helped Baba out of the office, I turned over the new word in my mind. Mass seemed even more ominous than suspicious. It turned out that, like Satan, cancer had many names. Baba's was called oat cell carcinoma inoperable. He refused any palliative treatment. When we got home, I said, I wish you'd give the chemotherapy a chance. I've made my decision, he growled. And one more thing. No one finds out about this, you hear me? I don't want anybody's sympathy. For a while, even cancer couldn't keep Baba from the flea market. Then one cool Sunday he was selling a lampshade whilst I was rummaging in the van for a blanket to cover his legs when his customer yelled, Hey man, this guy needs help. I turned round and I found Baba on the ground, his arms and legs jerking. A crowd gathered. I heard the word seizure, a voice calling 911. At the hospital, the doctor took me out of the room. The cancer's metastasized. He'll have to take steroids to reduce the swelling in his brain. And I'd recommend palliative radiation. Do you know what that means? I did. I'd become conversant in cancer talk. I spent the night sitting on a chair next to Baba's bed. The next morning, the waiting room was jammed with Afghans. They filed in and paid Baba their respects in hushed tones. Mid-morning, General Tahiri and his wife came. Saraya followed. We glanced at each other, looked away at the same time. The general took Baba's hand. How are you, my friend? Baba motioned to the IV hanging from his arm, smiled thinly. The general smiled back. Do you need anything? Anything at all? Ask me like you'd ask a brother. As Baba shook his head, I remember something he'd once said about Pashtuns. We may be hard-headed, and I know we're far too proud, but in the hour of need, believe me, there is no one you'd rather have at your side. The general turned to me. How are you, Amir Jan? The kindness in his eyes caused a lump in my throat. I bolted from the room and my eyes filled with tears. Soraya followed. I'm so sorry, Amir. We all knew something was wrong, but we had no idea it was this. I blotted my eyes with my sleeve. He didn't want anyone to know. She put a hand on mine. Our first touch. They discharged Baba two days later. That night he lay on the couch under a wool blanket. I brought him hot tea and roasted almonds wrapped my arms around his back and pulled him up much too easily. Can I do anything else for you, Baba? Nah, thank you. I sat beside him. Then I wonder if you'll do something for me, if you're not too exhausted. What? I want you to ask General Tahiri for his daughter's hand. Baba's dry lips stretched into a smile. Are you sure? More sure than I've ever been about anything. The next morning, I stopped outside the Tahiri's flat. As I drove away, Baba was in the rearview mirror, hobbling up the drive for one last fatherly duty. 
As instructed, I went home and waited. The phone rang just before noon. The general accepted. I sat down, my hands shaking. He did? Yes, but Saraya wants to talk to you first. There was a click, and then Saraya's voice. Amir? I was smiling. I'm so happy I don't know what to say. I'm happy too, but listen. There's something you need to know. I don't want us to start with secrets, and I'd rather you hear it from me. If it'll make you feel better, but it won't change anything. There was a pause at the other end. When we lived in Virginia, I ran away with an Afghan man. I was 18, rebellious, stupid, and he was into drugs. We lived together for almost a month. My father eventually found us and made me come home. I was hysterical. I said I hated him. When I got back, I saw my mother had had a stroke. The right side of her face was paralyzed. I felt so guilty. She didn't deserve that. My father moved us to California shortly after. There was a silence. How are you and your father now? We've always had our differences. But I am grateful he came for me. I really believe he saved me. Does what I told you bother you? A little. I owed her the truth. But I pondered this a lot in the weeks before I asked Baba to go to her parents. And in the end, the question that always came back to me was this. How could I, of all people, chastise someone for their past? Does it bother you enough to change your mind? No, Saraya, not even close. She broke into tears. I envied her. Her secret was out, dealt with. I opened my mouth and almost told her how I betrayed Hassan, driven him out, destroyed a 40-year relationship between Baba and Ali. But I didn't. I suspected there were many ways in which Saraya Tahiri was a better person than me. Courage was just one of them.